Open the pod bay doors. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wild away. 6, 56 degrees. Um, that was actually my first film. Um, as uh, Richard mentioned, I'm a trained mechanical engineer um, and designer. I also consider myself a filmmaker. Um, so uh, sort of what I was going to do here tonight was just say a brief couple words on R2 and Love and why I made it and that process. And then I'm going to seamlessly transition into my work at Autodesk and uh, hopefully explain why that's relevant to the film you're about to see, the, the feature film. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Um, so back in 2011, I was doing my master's at Cal and um, doing all these engineering classes and I sort of started coming to this realization that I didn't really want to do like hardcore mechanical engineering. I didn't want to be like designing springs that were going to go in cars for like two years, uh, you know, two years at a time. Um, so I started just kind of exploring um, things that I found interesting and one of those has always been filmmaking and visual effects. Um, and then I slowly started to admit to myself like, I kind of I want to be a director, <laughs> um, and then with that came the realization that uh, no one's gonna give me something to direct. The only way I'm gonna be a director is if I just go direct something myself. Um, so I started to sort of explore um, different ideas, just like you know brainstorming to myself um, as I walked to class and things like that. Um, I was really inspired by the sort of like you know three and a half minute fun uh, YouTube uh, like YouTube shorts that um, that kind of the young kids were doing, and um, I thought, okay, that's, that seems like something I could handle, you know, do something that I could film in a weekend. Um, and then I, just, I started to think, okay, like what are the, like the really cool things I have access to that a lot of people don't, and uh, what's the type of film that I would love to see that I haven't seen yet, and then I'll, I'll make that film. So at the time, I had I'd recently joined the R2 Builders Club, which is kind of an online builder community um, of people who, who make R2s. Um, so I was in the process of building my droid and I you know, sort of thought like it would be great to see a little short film with R2, uh, which I hadn't seen before. Um, uh, so I reached out to uh, some local builders who I hadn't really met yet, um, so Grant, Grant being one of them, kind of described my idea for a short film and Grant, against his better judgment, said like, oh, well you can use my, my R2 since yours isn't finished. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, so we sort of set out um, to make our, our tune up. My, my droid's actually the pink one at the end there, um, which we, we sort of built as we were filming the rest of the stuff. Um, so we were kind of nights and weekends, like making props, making all the little like wine holders and things like that, um, while we would shoot, you know, one weekend every couple months. Um, so that's sort of where, where our tune love came from. Um, after, after I finish uh, my talk, uh, feel free to ask me questions on that or, um, or the rest of my talk. Um, so watch this transition here. Okay, so in my free time, I like to play with robots, uh, but during the daytime at work, I also like to play with robots. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> All right, um, so for those not familiar with Autodesk, um, we make tools for people who make things. So we make design software, CAD software, uh, you might have heard of AutoCAD, but um, people who make uh, airplanes, buildings, toothbrushes, cars, R2s, um, all the way to uh, feature films and video games, uh, we make software uh, for those people. Um, so at Autodesk, I work on the applied research team, uh, and it's our job to look 20, 50, 100 years into the future and look at the technologies um, and patterns that we think are gonna be really important for us as humans in the future, for our customers, uh, and for Autodesk, and we explore those areas through hands-on design projects. So uh, one of the themes you'll see um, kind of in, in the feature film is uh, sort of exploring our relationship uh, with technology. So in our lab, we do um, obviously a lot of work with robots, um, but we're also interested in things like uh, machine learning and Internet of Things and virtual reality. Uh, but kind of one of the underlying themes that we explore is what is going to be the nature of of work in the future and how are we going to interact with intelligent machines, with robots and, um, and things like that. So uh, kind of with that lens, um, sort of want to talk about uh, the nature of work and interacting with machines in the future. 
Um, so we believe that in the next 20 years, we're going to see more changes in the way we work than in the past 2,000 years. So we can sort of um, define four major historical eras um, based, based on uh, if you take the lens of ha how we do our work. So you have the, the hunter-gatherer age, which lasted for uh, millions of years. Uh, then came the agricultural age, which lasted a couple thousand years. Then the, the industrial age, uh, which lasted a couple centuries. And then finally, the one we're most familiar with, the information age, uh, which has only been around a few decades. Uh, but right now, we're, we're on the cusp of uh, a new great era as a species, uh, the augmented age. So in this uh, new era, our natural human capabilities are going to be radically augmented by computational systems that help us think, robotic systems that help us make, and digital nervous systems that help us connect with the world around us. Uh, so let's start with uh, cognitive augmentation. How many of you guys consider yourself augmented cyborgs? OK, we got a couple, and that's probably just because we're in Marin. But, um, <laughs> uh, but I actually would submit that, that, we, that we all are. Um, and here's an example why. So every time, literally every time I go to the movies with my wife, we're watching the trailers, and uh, I, I see someone I recognize, but I can't remember from where. And I lean over to her, and I'm like, who's that? And she's like, shut up, we're watching a movie. Um, so because I'm a good fil film goer, I wait till the end. But within seconds, because I have one of these, I know who that actor or actress was. I know what movie they were in. I know who directed it. I know what, all the other movies that they were in. Um, so, so everyone has access to this all the time right now. Uh, but this is just sort of a primitive beginning because even Siri is just a passive device. Uh, in fact, for the last three and a half million years, uh, all, all of our tools have been completely passive. So they do exactly what we tell them to and nothing more. So the, the first human tool here only cut uh, where we struck it. The artist's chisel only carves where they guide it. And even our most sophisticated design tools are useless without explicit direction. Um, so at Autodesk, we make uh, CAD software. CAD's, CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. And I would sort of um, uh, submit that uh, until just recently, computers haven't actually aided in the design of anything. They sort of served as kind of glorified drafting tools um, where the goal is for us to, as designers, to take what's in our head and just kind of express that through the computer. And we've sort of been limited in our ability to do that uh, because of things like this. Um, this, this is going to really kill me to make a Star Trek reference. Um, <laughs> but I want to be more like Scotty. I want to have a conversation with the computer. Um, so I want to say, uh, computer, I want to design a car, and then it can present cars to me to start. Maybe I've already designed cars before. Um, and then, uh, so it can show me some cars, and I can say, OK, this one's great. Let's, um, let's make it longer, make it more aerodynamic. Um, and then it could present me with more options. So now we're having a conversation about the design. Um, and so this type of conversation seems, um, seems like it would be a way off, but we're already starting uh, to make progress. So our tools, uh, our design tools, are starting to be, go from passive to being generative. So with generative design, we actually use algorithms um, to synthesize geometry. So, so those algorithms are creating brand new designs on their own. Um, so all they need from us now is our goals and constraints. So let's take this um, quadrotor helicopter here. Um, so now as a designer, I say, OK, I want to make a quadrotor drone. Um, it's going to have four propellers. Uh, I need it to be lightweight, relatively aerodynamic, and it needs to carry a payload. And then the algorithm will then go and explore the entire um, We'll explore the entire design or the entire solution space. So it'll go through 50, uh, you know, 50, 100 million options uh, and present to me the best ones. So something that I, as a human designer, could never come up with. So the computer is coming up with these uh, geometries all on its own. It doesn't need, you know, a starting point. I don't have to draw anything for it. Um, it designs things by itself now. Um, also, by the way, there's no, uh, no accident that this, uh, this looks a lot like the pelvis of a flying squirrel because the, the algorithms work much like um, natural evolution works. 
Um, so this, again, might seem uh, rather futuristic, but we're, we're starting to see this be used in the real world. Uh, so we've been working with Airbus for the past few years to sort of imagine the airplane of the future. Um, so this guy is a ways off, but uh, just last year, we together made, here we go, uh, made this, which is a generatively designed and 3D printed airplane partition. <laughs> so this is designed by a computer. It is stronger than the original and half, half the weight of the original, which for air travel is huge. Um, and this will be in an airplane later this year, flying. So uh, the Airbus A320, I believe. Um, so now our computers can generate. Uh, they can come up with their own solutions, uh, but only to our, our sort of well-defined problem. They're not very intuitive. Uh, so they still, uh, they still have to start from scratch every single time. Uh, they don't learn, unlike these guys. Uh, Grant's going to laugh because he's actually met my dog, so he's going to laugh at what I'm about to say. But uh, these Cocker Spaniels right here are smarter than most of our design tools. So <laughs> these are my dogs. That's Huxley and Tahiti. This is actually on the set of R2 in Love, by the way, fun fact. Um, so, so Huxley and Tahiti learn, uh, not very well sometimes, but they know that if I pick up their leash, we're going for a walk uh, with a high probability of certainty. And they know that because every time I picked up their leash, we went for a walk. So they paid attention, they remembered what happened, and then they created and retained a pattern. So computer scientists have been trying to do this uh, for a long time. And what's really exciting is sort of the, the exponential speed of progress um, in just the last few years um, has, has been amazing. So you know, in 1952, they designed a computer that could play tic-tac-toe. And it took 45 years uh, for Deep Blue to beat uh, Gary Kasparov at chess. But only another 15 years uh, before Watson was able to beat two humans at Jeopardy. And this is a much more sophisticated uh, challenge for a computer. So Watson actually had to learn reasoning to beat them. It wasn't just kind of going through known patterns. And then just last year, uh, you might be familiar with the story, but uh, DeepMind's AlphaGo beat the world's uh, be best human Go champion. So if you're not familiar with Go, it's uh, uh, largely considered to be the, the hardest game, um, most difficult game that we have. Um, so Go has more uh, combinations of moves than atoms in the known universe. So for a computer to beat humans at Go, uh, it needs to go deeper than just sort of simple pattern recognition. It actually has to gain intuition and use that uh, to win. So in fact, when, Go, uh, when AlphaGo was making decisions, uh, they often puzzled the researchers. They didn't know why it was making certain decisions. So things are moving really fast. Uh, in less than a human lifetime, we've gone from playing a children's game all the way to what some would consider the pinnacle of strategic thought. So again, another Star Trek reference. Uh, this, this kills me. <laughs> um, but basically what's happening is computers are going from being a lot like Spock uh, to more like Kirk. So from pure logic, um, to intuition. You better not post that picture with me in it. <laughs> um, so take, take this bridge for example. A lot of you might see that and go, oh, I wouldn't cross that bridge. That looks dangerous. And you came to that conclusion in a split second based on your intuition. So that's the type of thing that um, our deep learning systems are developing uh, that, that we can put into our design tools. So you will literally be able to show a design tool uh, something that you want to make, and it can say, mm, that's not going to work, why don't you try again? And better yet, it could help you find the solution. Um, or you could ask if people are going to like your new song or your new flavor of ice cream. Uh, it's basically, and it's going to help us solve challenges that we've never faced before. So technology is amplifying our cognitive abilities so we can imagine and design things that were simply out of reach as like simple, unaugmented humans. Uh, so it's really exciting. So now that we can design kind of these, these weird things that we never could before, how do we make them? So the, the augmented age is just as much about the physical world as it is the digital world. So um, how are we going to augment ourselves physically? We're going to do that through robotic systems. So a lot of talk right now, and this is definitely happening. Um, uh, robots are stealing our jobs. Um, 
we've seen that in um, a couple sectors right now, especially the automotive. Um, but we sort of um, see a space between where there's an area where humans and robots can work together to achieve things neither, uh, neither could achieve on their own. So uh, welcome back to, this is my lab, I'm, I'm up there with my headphones on. Um, so one of our areas of exploration is this, um, the center area of human-robot human collaboration. So uh, as an experiment, we took Bishop. This is actually the same robot in R2 and Love that was doing the, the caricature. Uh, it was one of our more approachable robots. Uh, so we paired Bishop up with a human, and the human can interact with Bishop through um, simple language uh, and gestures to describe a problem. So in this case, uh, cutting drywall. Uh, so cutting like a light socket hole in drywall. Uh, so humans doing what the humans good at, which is uh, awareness, perception, decision making, and the robot's doing what the robot is good at, which is precise movement, um, executing um, kind of repetitive emotions over and over. Um, here's another project we did called Hive. Um, so the idea of Hive was to prototype um, the experience of humans, robots, and artificial intelligence all working together uh, to build a structure. So uh, during this project, humans would uh, kind of provide, provide the manual labor. They would navigate uh, materials to, to robots and to the structure. And they do all the things that humans were, were good at, like tying ropes and things like that. Uh, and the robots would do what they're good at, which was winding, winding these um, tensegrity structures, which I've actually tried to do a bunch myself, and it was really hard. Um, so something your robot's really good at. And then we had an artificial intelligence layer that was sort of choreographing everything that was happening. So we had you know, some th thousands of parts. Uh, things had to get made in a very specific order. And we had kind of a workforce that had never worked with a robot before. So we had a bunch of people just kind of off the street come in um, and, and walk their way through this, uh, through this process. And uh, here's another example where uh, we're working with uh, an artist out of Amsterdam named Joris Larman and his group called MX3D to generatively design and robotically 3D print a bridge in Amsterdam. Uh, so the idea is that the bridge will be designed with a human and a, and a computer working together. And then when it's done, they'll hit go. The robots will 3D print the bridge. Uh, you come back a couple months later and you will have a bridge without human intervention. So as computers are going to augment our ability to imagine and design new stuff, robotic systems are going to augment our ability to make things that we were never uh, able to make before. Uh, but what we need now is uh, a nervous system to connect everything. So the human nervous system uh, is constantly giving, uh, giving us feedback of everything that's happening around us. But the nervous system we've given to the things we make is pretty rudimentary at best. So my car doesn't tell the city uh, when it hits a pothole, which has been happening a ton recently because of all the rain. It's crazy. Um, a building doesn't tell the architect how its building is actually being used and if people enjoy being there. And toys don't tell uh, their designers how a toy is being played with, when and where it's being played with, and if it's even any fun. So this is the sweet life that toy designers imagined for Barbie, uh, but what if Barbie is actually super lonely? <laughs> so, <laughs> so if designers know this type of information, if they know when and where and how things are being used, they could use that knowledge to make uh, an experience that's better for the end user. So what's missing is that, that nervous system that connects, connects the things together and then connects all that information back into the design tools. So last year, uh, we as humans made a bunch of stuff, and then we spent $2 trillion convincing people that they wanted it. But if we had this type of nervous system, if we could capture this data and we could feed it back into the design process, then maybe we can just make stuff that people actually want in the first place. Um, so again, this, this seems like uh, kind of a little ways away, uh, but we've already already been working on these kind of digital nervous system tools uh, to inform how we design. So we worked with a group of guys uh, based out of LA called the Bandito Brothers. Uh, these guys are, are wild. They're stunt drivers. Uh, they have a production company as well. Um, so they do all these crazy, this is some stuff they did with Hot Wheel. In a sec, it'll show um, they did a real life Hot Wheel 360 loop, which is crazy. Um, 
So we worked with them to basically they, they built us a custom kind of dune buggy uh, race chassis and then we put sensors all over it, gave it to um, kind of a badass uh, race car driver out in the desert, drove the crap out of it, got all that sensor data, and then we fed that into our generative design AI that we call Dreamcatcher. And then, uh, so this is sort of uh, one of the results of those tests, is a uh, generatively designed uh, race car chassis uh, that's unlike any chassis that a human could ever design, but it's perfect uh, for what, uh, what conditions it's under. Uh, so if this is the future of this kind of augmented age, uh, where we're going to be augmented cognitive, cognitively, physically, and perceptually, um, then I can sort of um, imagine a world where we move from things that are fabricated uh, to things that are farmed, uh, from constructing things to growing things. Uh, we'll move from being isolated to being more connected. Got some bur burner fans in the, <laughs> in the house. Um, we'll move, move away from, from extraction and embrace aggregation. Uh, we'll shift from craving obedience from the things we make and start to value autonomy in them. Uh, so uh, I'll leave you with, uh, with a good analogy, I think, for, for this world. Um, it's going to be dramatically different from the one we live in. Um, that uh, this uh, microcosm of a coral reef, I think, is perfect to express that in this world where all these things are possible, we're going to see more variety, more connectedness, more dynamism, more complexity, more adaptability, and of course, more beauty. Um, and that's a world uh, I'm really looking forward to. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, I don't know how much time we have, but happy to take uh, happy to take some questions. Yes, uh, it, is, it is available on YouTube. Uh, just yeah, if you Google R2 and love, and we spell R2 phonetically, A R T O O, um, which some people say that's not how you spell it, but that's actually um, how it was spelled in the script, I believe, right? Uh, and and uh, in all the books, so that's sort of a um, an homage to that. Um, but yeah, you can, you can find it on, on YouTube there. Yeah. Um, that's a tough one because um, I think, um, yeah, when we, when we think about creating robots and specifically humanoid robots, we, um, I mean, historically in films even, we've um, kind of always made robots in the image of ourselves, but we're actually like, we would make really bad robots the way we're designed. We're like really good humans. We're like really, this is a really bad robot design. So I think, um, the future will be something probably pretty unrecognizable from, from what we think of as robotics today. Um, I mean, I'll give you another example. Uh, if, you, if you drive a car, that's a robot, especially if you're in a Tesla right now and you, um, you kind of pull up to your house and you live on a rocky, little rocky terrain, it actually lifts itself up. That's a robot. <laughs> um, so there, there are a lot of things that, um, there's a broad definition of robot. So. Um, but how long till we get to there? That's, that's hard to say because sometimes I'm really optimistic. When I give talks like this, I'm really optimistic. And then I go into work the next day and I like, can't get my robot to turn on. <laughs> so, so it brings, brings you back to Earth, Earth a little bit. But um, yeah, it's hard to say. So I know that was a non-answer, but <laughs> hopefully still satisfying. <laughs> All right, any other questions on R2 and Love, R2 Building, or, or Autodesk? Yes. Um, we actually might, we got, we got long drives home, so we might actually leave just after this, but we're always at Maker Fair. If you want to come to Maker Fair, um, Marin County Fair, Marin County Fair will be at. So we're, we're around, so we'll find you another opportunity. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, that's actually at uh, Pier 9 on the Embarcadero. Um, so we have a, a huge work workshop there. We have, you know, CNC room, wood shop, metal shop, 3D print lab, and then uh, we have our, our sort of lab at the end where we do weird robotic stuff and, and virtual reality. Um, if you're ever kind of around um, kind of the ferry building area at One Market um, is, is kind of our main San Francisco office. And on the second floor, we have a gallery there that's open to the public Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And you can go check out. Um, that's generally like all the work of our customers. So we have a car, you know, a car in there, concept design from Mercedes, and the concept is that the car has grown from seeds using nothing but the planet, or 
nothing but the energy from the sun. So you got a lot of like really cool, crazy design stuff in there. If you just you know want to swing by and come check out the Autodesk Gallery, see what our customers do with our stuff. That's always fun. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So <laughs> uh, the the lab is actually we're people think because we're a robotics lab and we're kind of in this advanced R and D field that we're, we're like super secretive, but we're actually like a pretty, I think Autodesk in general is a pretty open company, um, and, and our lab is pretty open with what we do. So if you want to see just some of the fun stuff we do, I have like kind of a video blog called todayonthelab.com where I just post like some stuff that's been happening around the lab, check out what we do. Um, maybe, maybe we can actually organize like a small group, uh, you know, through, through CFI, um, maybe I'll, I'll talk, to, talk to John or something, um, or you guys, uh, you know, have like 10 or 15 people sign up and come come to the lab would be cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> any any other questions? Yes. Uh, this particular one weighs about 200 pounds, so it sort of depends on the material. So each person builds their own, um, and people make different uh, different material decisions depending on budget, um, the tools they have, and things like that. So. Um, we have, you know, some friends that have uh, fully styrene plastic droids that weigh, you know, half of what that is. But you know, this one's all aluminum. It's the real deal. So it's pretty, pretty heavy. <laughs> um, yes. Anything else? Yes. <laughs> I, I do. Do you know? Because that's are you are you leading the witness? So I'm actually working on a um, a five foot Millennium Falcon. Uh, so scale model of the original shooting model they made for A New Hope. So, you know, perfect, uh, perfect replica of the five-foot um, Falcon, which if you've seen at, you know, one of the Smithsonian traveling exhibits is amazing. Um, but my plan after, after I finish the model is to put it on one of our robots, put a camera on another robot, and do some kind of old school um, kind of motion control with some, with some new, school, new school tools. So that's, that's my current uh, personal project. Also got a BB-8 that's just sort of laying around in pieces. So <laughs> got some other droids, but I still actually have to finish my R2. So mine was the pink one at the end there, um, which uh, doesn't have the drive system yet. So I got to finish finish that. I got a lot of little projects. Um, I also have um, uh, a little human project that's happening. My wife is pregnant, so I got a little <laughs> got the the original 3D printer. Um, uh, so. So yeah, got got that. I remember. So I'm trying to get all my personal projects done before <laughs> before the little guy comes. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, that um, it's something I definitely want to pursue more. I've had some ideas here and there, uh, but nothing is like stuck as much. And then I just got all the I, I get like really excited about. Um, I'm for, fortunate in that like I love what I do for work, and I get really excited by all that stuff. So it's been hard to like find time to do all all this stuff. Um, but I do have some ideas. What I'm trying to do is get. Um, get work to like kind of support me doing a short film, like a sci-fi short film that ties into a lot of the stuff that we're doing and just kind of do it that way, um, <laughs> which, which would be the dream. So uh, I definitely plan on any kind of pursuing that more, more when I can though. So yeah, any, any other questions? Cool, that, feel, that feels good, good. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for listening, thanks for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> We're going to roll R2 off here. There we go. <laughs>